Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you all so much for coming to our panel today, and I would also especially like to thank the College of Medicine, the Office of Diversity, Health, and Equity, especially Ms. Joyce Lizwicha, um, for giving us this food and for this room, and thank you all for coming today as we talk about our panel um, for the celebration of Diversity Week. We're honoring LGBTQIA plus health stories, and I would especially like to welcome our panelists. Um, Dr. Grenman, he works in the College of Pharmacy, and he is joining us from sunny Arizona. And I would especially like to thank and welcome Dr. Carolyn Holland and Dr. Emma Moss. So we are going to be talking today about um, LGBTQIA plus health stories and how we hopefully can share valuable insight to future healthcare providers and advocates. And we can share advice for LGBTQIA plus members as they seek healthcare. So we are going to be having a discussion and at the end of the discussion, um, we're gonna open up the panel to questions. So in the middle of the table, you have this wonderful little device. You can press the button and you'll be able to ask your question. All right, so thank you so much for coming today. So um, if you don't mind, uh, could you please like introduce yourselves and like tell us a little bit more about who you, uh, where you work? Uh, so I'll start. <clears throat> uh, my name is Carolyn Holland. I'm on the faculty in emergency medicine. Um, I'm a University of Florida alum undergrad and I did my training in Cincinnati. Um, I came out as a lesbian in 1993, and I am partnered with two women, and I have three children. So I'm not only just a lesbian, I'm also poly, which is a whole other layer of sexual diversity. I'm Emma Moss. I'm a PGY-6 radiology resident here at Chan's. I did undergrad at Penn State and then med school and some pre-med stuff at FSU before coming here. And I'm going to Arizona for a neuroradiology neuro fellowship in June. Woo! So, <laughs> or end of June, July. Um, I came out as trans officially, it was the day after the 2016 election, was, but I was transitioning for the year before that just hadn't gone in, quote, girl mode, end quote. Um, and yeah, I identify as queer by, that's, that's about that. Okay, uh, Dr. Grenman? Oh, Dr. Grenman, we can't hear you. Hold on one second. Is your, We are fixing that right now. One second. So while we wait, uh, Dr. Oliver Grunman, he is at the UF College of Pharmacy in the Department of Medicinal Chemistry. So anyone from the College of Pharmacy here today? No? All right. Well, um, he is the director of the online graduate programs in pharmaceutical chemistry and clinical toxicology. And we are going to be learning a little bit more about the program, uh, the committee he created last fall um, under the College of Pharmacy, their Office of Diversity and Inclusion. So I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more about that. Okay. Let's see. No. They're working on it, Dr. Grumman. Yeah. So sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. I do love your tie, though. It is a magnificent tie. Thumbs up on that. <laughs> Okay, so we'll just keep going and then we will hopefully be able to hear you, Dr. Grumman. So we're going to ask you some questions. Um, how has being a member of the LGBTQIA community shaped your health story? 
So for me, I was out before I went to med school, and it was interesting because my first year, I was the only out person in my whole class, and there was one out person in the class ahead of me, and then there was a very small LGBT group that was sponsored by a faculty member on psychiatry who was a gay man, and that was it. And there was no education about LGBT health issues at all until I personally gave a lunchtime talk to my classmates about it. There was no cultural competency training. There was no acknowledgement that maybe having, you know, husband or wife or male or female as the only choices on paperwork that you had to fill out. Um, we didn't learn anything about transgender, anything, hormones, treatments, nothing. Um, so I'm really excited that that has changed over time, because here at UF, I know we do include a lot of that in the med school curriculum. The probably biggest challenge for me was when I, we decided to have children, and going to the reproductive endocrinologist, we had to search really hard to find one that was LGBT friendly, that wasn't going to not choose to help us make our family. Um, and we found a really great one in Cincinnati. His name was Michael Thomas. And we were not the first lesbian relationship that he had dealt with. And, you know, we picked a donor from an online sperm bank that was also very LGB friendly. And found an OBGYN who, though she was a conservative Republican, was also very welcoming of our family and made sure that both of the partners could be in the delivery room, even though you're only supposed to allow one because it was a uh, C-section. And she was kind enough to put her foot down and say, no, both people are coming. And so I was really, really lucky. But I have friends who have not been as lucky. Um, and part of that luck was, I think, being in the healthcare system. It's somewhat easier to identify providers who are open and as opposed to if I'm in the lay public and I'm trying to find a doctor or a healthcare provider to identify those who are open and willing to provide appropriate care regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity, finding those people is very, very difficult. And I don't know about you or Dr. Grunman, but when we first tried to, before I went to med school, trying to find a doctor, there are no real good resources. Even now, there's the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association that has a directory for providers. And in the Gainesville area, there's like four listed total. And I know that that's not the correct number of people who are supportive of LGBT patients because I have friends with many of them, but they're not listed in that directory, nor many of the other directories. And so that's, I think, a biggest challenge, is finding a provider who isn't just willing, but is enthusiastic about providing appropriate, culturally competent care. So first off, I'd like to point out one glaring thing with the panel, is that we're all white. And so people of color have a very different experience than us. And so our experiences are unique on their own. My healthcare story with it all is relatively short compared to most people. I, when I first decided to transition, I had really, I'm a doctor, I had no idea where to start. I just Googled found what I could just to get the process started. And at the time, there was really two main prescribers of hormone therapy that people talked about in Gainesville, which took some weeding around to find. And then you had to wait an eternity to get on there after you spent the thousand plus dollars in therapy to get your le magical letter to say you can get the hormone replacement therapy and then wait another three months for your appointment and all this stuff. Um, and I'm fortunate to have supportive parents that can help financially and uh, help me with fertility preservation, which is something that not a lot of trans people get to do. And that's another couple thousand dollars. And then I really became a patient with surgery stuff 
too. I had facial feminization surgery, which had to travel to an expert for that. And that's another 20 something thousand dollars. And then last June I had uh, gender confirmation, gender affirmation surgery and breast augmentation. And, and I elected for a surgeon in Thailand because I didn't want to wait two to three years for to get into a surgeon here. And so there you have to then fly to Thailand and spend a month in a Bangkok uh, hotel. And yeah, so the real issues, I guess, it's the access and just knowing where to start and then feeling comfortable because it's kind of a bias group here. The people here are the ones that are interested in furthering their knowledge and perhaps doing something about LGBTQ care in the future. But for all of you here, there's a lot more people who aren't that are also continuing in the field that, and they're really the ones that need to kind of bring forward and probably hear it the most. Thank you. Dr. Grunman, we should be able to hear you now. <laughs> no, <don't. laughs> I'm so sorry, Dr. Grunman. Um, let's. You know, that is a good idea. Maybe you should call on the cell phone and we can hold that up to the microphone. Huh? Oh, Dr. Grumman, uh, could you check your side to make sure you're not accidentally muted? It is all on us, okay. Uh, okay. All right, um, hold on one second, Dr. Grumman. See. So we'll fill up the space with our own commentary while they're troubleshooting this. I think if you guys are, most of you all are medical students or in healthcare, and one of the nicest things that's happening this week here at UF is that the EPIC upgrade is happening, for those of you who don't know. And in the new version of EPIC, you're allowed to put in the patient's preferred gender, their pronouns, um, a different name that might, than that what might, that might, what might be listed on their birth certificate or other things, and also um, information about where they are in their surgical transition process, if at all, because health maintenance for a trans man who still has ovaries in a uterus is different than a trans man who has had a hysterectomy. And the same would be true for a, a trans woman who still has testicles and that sort of stuff. The health, health maintenance issues are different. And so UF is finally getting into the 21st century with our new EPIC upgrade with the electronic health record that's going to include that all, all that information in a standardized, readily accessible location as opposed to having to search through some notes somewhere 15 years past or 15 notes in the past. So, so good job for EPIC having the new upgrade to include stuff related to gender identity. And so good job. And before, before all of it, um, so I had my passport and driver's license all had female on the markers. And then here it had my name change, my current name, and then it had my dead name as an alias. And then it would print off on the prescriptions, it would still print off male on the side. And just yesterday when I had an appointment, they let me change it finally the gender marker after three years that 
what should be. So, but uh, the before this epic upgrade, there were modules that a lot of places paid extra for that had this stuff, and like the thing, like the gender surgery is often called like an organ inventory, which is kind of a, a little bit of a serial killer <laughs> phrasing to me, but <laughs> gets the point across. Testing audio to Gainesville, can you hear me? I think I should be online, right? Yes, thank you, excellent. <laughs> so, um, so happy to have you here, Dr. Grunman. Um, Yay, hooray. So, <laughs> could you please share with us how being a member of the LGBTQA community helped shape your health story? So, hello everybody, first off, uh, I'm actually originally from Germany, so my health story may be a little bit different. I, I graduated from a pharmacy school there, and uh, I came out um, pretty much in high school, so similar to, to Carolyn's exper experience. Um, and then I was also the only one uh, during my college years uh, to to be uh, 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 gay and 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 open about it, uh, which and I, I I kind kind of consciously chose to 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 be open about it because hiding that aspect of myself would just create uh, problems, uh, despite others telling me, especially my my parents telling me that it would be detrimental to my career and and all of that, um, I chose to be open about it. And uh, I really didn't have many problems with it, uh, I would say, personally. Um, what, what I have experienced, uh, because I, for a brief period of time, I, I was um, in an AIDS hospice working there on a volunteer basis. It has really uh, shown to me the the enormous pressure that still weighs on members of uh, specifically in this case the the gay community how at that point in time it was the early 2000s back then um, how one would be excluded from family from friends if they were specifically um, in in that category and, and it basically uh, kind of uh, often excluded uh, also, finding a healthcare provider that would be at one side and support somebody that had been diagnosed and was in advanced stages uh, of the viral infection uh, was difficult at that time. Uh, times have changed since then tremendously. I think there is still a lot that can be done. Uh, and, and I definitely agree that uh, we, we, we have made advances, but still we need to do a lot. And especially addressing the, the struggles that uh, transgender uh, patients face in identifying healthcare providers and helping them through uh, the transition process is, is a crucial one. I think that um, the lay public, but also many healthcare providers often do not know how to properly address uh, transgender patients who are in transition uh, or who are who have transitioned. Uh, I see that with our pharmacy students that often struggle with what are the, the pronouns, how to properly address a patient uh, and how to counsel them often too. Thank you. So I know we're talking about um, earlier during the wonderful lull about what services need to be improved upon. So I was wondering if you could go a little bit more in detail. Um, how do you think healthcare providers can en enhance the services for those who are a part of the LGBTQ community? So enhance uh, the top thing is just access and affordable access to care for everyone. And then there's a knowledge component that with gaining the knowledge, it will often also dispel a lot of the myths, which, but that needs to be implemented in the healthcare education and the, sure in med school, but really in 
each individual residency program specialty or in further nursing training and all the levels of care from that side. Um, it's, and it can be challenging because it's not necessarily the volume everywhere for it. Uh, example is my former roommate had surgery and she had complications from surgery that uh, she needed a urologist and the doctor here referred her to a urologist and it took two months to find one that would see her. She just got point blank turned down for being post-op trans woman from multiple urologists here and she is in just agonizing pain, unable to really urinate more than a tiny little few droplets at a time. And it was to the point that I would I even got supplies from to, with a pediatric Foley to try to help her before she got care. And there are people that, I mean, she was, uh, she had a master's in bioengineering. It's not like she was from a poor area or any, anything like that. And she was still struggling to get in. People just didn't know what to do. They wouldn't even consider looking at it like it was some horrendously different thing. It's, it was just plumbing. Like all that needed to end up being needed to be done was a little, ex, a little bit of an excision incision kind of open up the urethromyase a little bit. It was like a 15 minute surgery. So. So access is definitely critical. Um, the ability for a patient to identify that a, a provider has some sort of hopefully cultural competency, but at least um, respect and politeness. Um, I work in the emergency department and I have seen patients, the example I'm going to use is a, a Muslim woman who's in a hijab, who's there with her family member and doesn't want to see a male provider because of her religious beliefs and cultural background. And we try as much as we can to accommodate that. If, you know, if there's only male doctors there, then you got to do what you got to do. But we try to accommodate that, even though I personally don't have a problem seeing a male doctor or seeing a female doctor. Unfortunately, and, and we try to give the best care possible. So if a, a patient doesn't believe in birth control, then we're not going to try to convince them to go on birth control. I would like to see that same level of respect that even if you don't agree with my particular family structure or lifestyle or gender identity or sexual orientation or whatever else, that you are respectful of my autonomy and my choices and you help me navigate my health in relation to my choices as opposed to trying to take your values and put them on me and my life. And that is all we ask of providers every day related to other topics. And so it should be easy to transition that to LGBTQ patients, but that doesn't always happen. And I'm gonna give you an example. Um, not just cultural competency, but whenever I go to see a provider of any kind, and to, if it's the first visit, they're always like, so are you sexually active? And I say, yes. What method of birth control do you use? None. Are you trying to get pregnant? No. Well, then why aren't you using birth control? And I'm like, I don't use sperm. And they still go, huh? And it's like they haven't even thought of the concept that it's possible to be sexually active and not be with a man and not have to worry about getting pregnant. And so just the thought that they that never crossed their mind tells me that they're not culturally competent. You know, it asks for, you go to the OBGYN doctor's office and ask for your husband when you're there, when you're pregnant. I'm like, cross that out, partner. Um, so having forms that are culturally competent that don't assume that it's a husband and a wife or a mom and a dad in a pediatrician's office, that it could be two moms or three moms or two dads or a mom and two dads. Um, I think those are simple things that, that are probably not emotionally loaded that 
offices could do to make them at least seem more accessible to patients. Um, so. So to add to this, uh, what we just conducted um, and what Lauren was uh, was hinting at uh, was a climate survey at the College of Pharmacy asking students, faculty and staff uh, about their opinion uh, about LGBTQ uh, issues at the College of Pharmacy, uh, how they uh, feel uh, that of their concerns, uh, specifically the LGBTQ members of the College of Pharmacy were properly addressed at the college, but also how current the current curriculum, uh, the PharmD curriculum actually addressed LGBTQ topics adequately. So uh, we're still looking at the data because uh, the, uh, the results just, the, the survey just finished last week. Uh, so I'm still wading through it, but this was an initiative that was led by uh, the committee that I co-chair uh, on LGBTQ uh, I and allies um, uh, topics uh, in the college. Um, so this is important to us as a community because we, we don't really have that yet in the college. And to my knowledge, uh, no college of pharmacy yet has particularly addressed this um, this topic in their in their curriculum consistently. We have a few patient care cases where we incorporate same-sex couples or where we have, uh, a, I think we have one transgender case. Um, but although students may be comfortable interacting with members of the LGBTQ community, we do not address necessarily how to specifically address LGBTQ related healthcare topics. So how to counsel a patient that is a member of the LGBTQ community when it comes to their particular health situation. So uh, one example is for a transgender person, how to counsel them on particular topics related to their transitioning. Uh, and there are so many issues where pharmacists can assist and, and counsel through that process um, as, as really a, an ally and, and a guide, uh, especially when, um, uh, whenever when you say at the beginning to provide guidance or uh, support uh, in, in identifying resources. Uh, I think a pharmacist can assist in that, um, uh, just, just providing some, some resources. So we try to address that and identify uh, educational needs uh, for both faculty and students now. Thank you so much. Um, so my next question is, we have a lot of future healthcare professionals in this room, which is a great thing. What do you think current physicians and these future healthcare professionals should know when treating uh, the needs of the LGBTQ community? So the first thing that you need to know is that it's okay to ask questions because I can tell you for a lot of people in the LGBT community, they are actually probably a better expert about their health care needs than you are, and especially for trans individuals. Um, I mean, I don't know the issues that a trans individual goes through. I, I volunteer at um, the LGBT night that Equal Access puts on where they see patients who are transitioning. And we had somebody there that was going to start hormones. They'd already gone through all the therapy stuff. And I'm like, I've never done this. So you know what I did? I called my friend who's a trans woman. And I was like, so Taylor, what do I need to do? Because she, who was a physician, also had just gone through the process and could walk me through what to prescribe because I'm not an expert, even though I'm part of the community. So it's okay to ask questions. It's, a, it's okay to ask people how they'd like to be identified, what name they'd like to be called, what pronoun you're supposed to use. Don't assume. That is probably the most important thing that you can do because 
they are the expert. And so you ask them and they will let you know what they need, what they want to be addressed as. Um, don't assume that uh, the same health care issues are true for a gay man as a lesbian. And I'll give you a quick example and then I'll hand off the mic. So before med school, we were looking for primary care physicians in the greater DC area. And we went in our insurance card and this person looked nice. And there was no Google back then because this was a while ago. And my partner went to see the physician and she's a pretty butch lesbian. And um, like you walk in the room and it's like, hi, I'm a lesbian. And she's chatting with the doctor about what do you think are the most important healthcare issues for a lesbian? And if you're informed, like we were, we knew it was, if you don't ever have a baby, that makes you at higher risk for breast cancer. There's a higher use of smoking and alcohol and overweight in the lesbian community. So those are the healthcare issues for lesbians, not HIV AIDS. And that was what the doctor brought up. And I'm like, wait a second, like we are the lowest risk group in general as compared to even heterosexuals. And that was what the physician brought up as what she thought was the most important healthcare need for a lesbian. So she looked stupid. We never went back and saw her again. We found some somebody, somebody else. She could have easily turned that around and say, you know, I'm not really 100% familiar. What are the things that you're most worried about? And I'll do some research. And that would have been a much better way to handle it than putting her foot in her mouth. And I'll pass on the mic. Yeah, that's kind of, it's the big thing and it really, it translates to all areas of doctoring healthcare is not being afraid to say, I don't know. I've found that patients really appreciate when you're honest and say, so I'm not going to blow smoke. I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to find out for you and we'll, if it's not something I feel like I can handle, we'll get you the person I can and go with it from there. So that's always real uh, big part of it. Language wise, it's, um, it's the not assuming and really just using broader terms that can describe everything all in one instead of having to be hyper specific. Like, do you really need to say, uh, female, male, and some of the stuff if, uh, for, for me with like radiology, it's not really that important to say 63 year old female with whatever, if there's a uterus there, there's a uterus there. Like I've scanned a, a phenotypically, a phenotypic male assigned male birth that had a uterus and ovaries. So you can't, you can never assume and it's just, you just use the more general or just leave out the kind of irrelevant stuff that can uh, skew things. Other than that, there are kind of signals and cues that you can use. Uh, one of them that I've recommended to a friend that's a family med practitioner in North Carolina that took over uh, the trans and young adult or trans teen young adult care it was uh, just to have a pin with her pronouns on it on her white coat and anyone that's in the know can kind of gauge that signaling but it's also subtle enough that if there's a patient or a parent or someone that doesn't pick up on it, they, then it just kind of flies under the radar as well. So just little things like that. Yeah, I've got I've got little to add. Uh, both of the other panelists, kind of uh, Carol, uh, Caroline, and Emma, both both said it very well. Okay, so we'll move on to our next question. Um, how has identifying as LGBTQIA influenced your approach to teaching patients and for those of you that are professors, educating our future healthcare professionals? Let me start off. <laughs> so um, since I've, I've always been out from the very beginning, I've, I've never really held back 
uh, when people ask me about my private life, I've, I've not worn it like, uh, like I'm wearing it today necessarily. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, I, I've never hidden it uh, or anything. Uh, I, I'm using also more case examples when, I, when we work with cases, um, patient cases of um, either same-sex couples or uh, transgender uh, 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 patients uh, when we when we work uh, in that scenario setting. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to push a little bit in that direction. Um, what I find is interesting is a little bit of the um, of the 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 push from students actually that I see that they want to know more about this topic. So if I am open about it and if I'm straightforward about it, they are actually very receptive. Um, and they, they usually are uh, more open about it as well. They inquire um, and, and they open up themselves as well. Um, on, the, on, the, on the faculty side, there seems to be a little bit more reservation. And some of that might have to do with uh, still a little bit of the, the older structure of uh, how um, promotion tenure potentially can be affected by that. Um, some people feel that, um, you know, the good old um, opposite sex or you have to be married or something like that. I don't know, in some departments or in some colleges may, may have an impact on that. It depends a little bit on leadership. I feel in the College of Pharmacy that that is not uh, the case, uh, uh, at least for me, I can speak only for myself, um, that that has not impacted my ability to be my true self. Um, and so I, I can freely express myself to students and I haven't had any really negative uh, impact uh, or I haven't had any negative uh, feedback from that. And um, it really has made a, an impact on, on students asking specifically in some cases uh, about how to counsel patients when it comes to some of these scenarios that we discussed. So when it comes to, for example, prostate cancer, uh, and I, I dispelled some of the myths, Carolyn mentioned some of the myths around that, it isn't a higher risk for uh, gay males to have prostate cancer. That is statistically not the case. Um, uh, and and uh, uh, that was one myth that we talked about. Um, so I think there is a lot that can be done around, around this topic uh, when we incorporate uh, LGBTQ cases in our practice setting. So we see a fair number of LGBT in specifically trans patients, even in the pediatric emergency department, there's a pretty robust clinic that's run through the pediatric endocrinology. And actually, Dr. Kristen Davis, who helps run that clinic, is one of the people that championed the changes in EPIC. So good job. Sorry, Dayton, not Davis. Uh, anyways, um, <clears throat> excuse me. For me, I am constantly trying to make sure that not just the residents, but the support staff, the nursing staff are using the right terminology when they are interacting with patients. Because this might be one of the only times that they ever do interact with a, a gay or a lesbian or a trans patient. And reminding them to use the correct pronouns, even when they're referring to the patient outside of the patient's presence. Because a lot of times they'll revert back to what's ever in the EMR, even though this patient who their name in the EMR says Tim, but they choose to go by the name Taylor. Um, and that's, I think, where I have the biggest impact. I do participate in these sort of panels for the medical school. Um, we've had talks in my department for residents related to LGBT issues, thanks to an invited speaker that we had. But there's not many specific LGBT health emergencies that are different for an LGBT patient than a straight patient. 
other than some of the stuff that you were talking about related to post-op, but that's kind of unique. Um, so I don't have to, as an emergency physician, teach more specific healthcare stuff related to gender identity and sexual orientation. My job is cultural competency and making sure that those patients feel comfortable. You know, it's not like I don't kind of look like a lesbian. So when I walk in, usually patients are like, oh, she's family. Um, and it makes them feel comfortable. And my job is to make every encounter with one of my trainees make that patient feel just as comfortable as when I walk in the room. Yeah, that's being radiology. I don't have as much direct patient interaction. Uh, but when I do, since transitioning, I think there's been a little more uh, kind of showing my own vulnerability in parts to when explaining stuff and empathizing with patients that are scared, anxious, wondering about results. They have something unknown happening to them and we're trying to find a reason. Um, so from that side, there's that's about the most with that, but with, uh, so most of my educating is with faculty, staff, other people around me, and it's really just being almost obnoxiously LGBTQ, queerdo, going in with the rainbow on back, morale patch on backpack and correcting when it gets, things get a little heteronormative and and just assuming along those lines, but it it's a constant battle and it gets really exhausting at times. I, I have a standing invite for anyone that has any questions to come to me first, because I'd rather them ask me and rather than make a patient feel uncomfortable or, or just put the patient in an awkward position, um, which I've never really gotten anyone come up to me yet. And pretty much every day this week, well, th pretty much every day I'm in the hospital, I'll get misgendered numerous times still. Um, and I, I've gotten more vocal about correcting, but it's, st it's just, it's an exhausting thing to, because you're constantly screening for it, and then a lot of times it's someone that's higher up than you, and so you feel like you're in an awkward position to correct someone that's higher up. So whenever my friends are the ones that correct them for me, it kind of takes a lot of stress off of me. So it's being a good ally and standing up for other people is really important. And it's not just if you're queer or whatever, it's if different culture, different skin color, all of it. If there, there are lots of things that people say thinking they're okay because they're in the same company and it doesn't make them okay. And so sometimes you gotta stand up for it. Um, so, could you share a moment with us when you handled a difficult situation as a LGBTQ plus physician or a professor and how you overcame it and any recommendations for future LGBTQ healthcare providers if they get into a type of situation like that? Dr. Kerman? I have to think about that one. <laughs> um, that was specifically related to uh, to me being uh, being openly gay. I um, didn't necessarily have a a confrontation or anything like that, to be honest. Um, so I can't really speak to that. Um, on that level, um, I, I can't really think of, of, of anything that directly affected me personally um, on that level. 
I have to say. So maybe I'm I'm just really fortunate. I'm I know I'm 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 white, I'm male, so I'm privileged in that regard, I guess. Um, I have yeah. a story. It's not from me personally, but my partner, who's also a physician. Um, in emergency medicine, you know, we have to make quick, quick rapport with patients. We don't have longitudinal relationships with them. We're in pajamas because we're in scrubs. So there's less like, oh, you're dressed more butch or more femme or whatever. Um, but my partner works here uh, and she was seeing a patient and in her specialty, they have longitudinal relationships with these patients. And she is more butch looking than I am. And she walks into the room and it's someone from a more rural area who is very conservative, has got, you know, not necessarily racially sensitive tattoos on them, a couple of swastikas, that sort of stuff. And she takes wonderful care of the patient's family member. And this is a very similar story that I've heard told by my chair who had a similar experience. And by the end of their relationship together, the patient and the husband bring her a gift because they enjoyed her care so much, even though they could tell she was gay when she walked in the room and they were clearly not LGBT friendly, but she remained professional. She treated that patient like she would a family member. And that I think is the biggest impact that we can have. Like he talked about being out and being visible makes us less scary makes somebody who has all kinds of preconceived notions about what the LGBT community is from watching parades in San Francisco or wherever, that we are just as diverse amongst the LGBT community as the rest of society is. And we are nice and polite and can provide great care regardless of our sexual orientation or even because of our sexual orientation. And that interaction that she had with that patient and family is going to ripple out everywhere because she's hopefully turned down their biases just a notch or two so that the next time they might not have as much judgment. And that, I think, is the biggest impact. I haven't had somebody call me any bad names that were specific to my sexual orientation. I've been called lots of bad names in my practice. That's just part of being an emergency doctor. But they don't, they don't pick, you know, they call me other ones that I can't say here because we're being broadcast. Um, but I think it's because I can blend in when you're in pajamas or scrubs, as opposed to, you know, if everyone's wearing dresses and I'm wearing pants and a polo shirt, then people make some assumptions. Yeah, so the biggest, most threatening things have all been outside of the hospital for me. And I've had things, especially early on, yelled at me. I've been threatened. I, even before transitioning, I had a gun to put to my head and called some things. Um, but then, so in the hospital, it's a lot more of the kind of microaggression stuff that I don't, think people are necessarily cognizant of and then there's a little bit of this the kind of implicit biases maybe skewed in but for example I was originally supposed to complete residency last year and the week before I was leaving I was going to go have my surgery take the time off and then move to Seattle and start fellowship. But the week before that last week there, they told me that they weren't signing off on my graduation. And they, uh, they said it's, I kept on asking for more concrete reasons and kept on getting set or being told that it was because I was distracted for the last bit of time. And then, like, oh, you know, just look at the evals and pulled one out. And she was like, this one, they described me as hormonal and moody 
and chatty and all these things and they just like and there's a circular argument that I couldn't really do anything about and I found out that I was getting um, that they weren't going to set off my graduation from my former fellowship director before I found out from the people here so they had communicated with them first and so then it's this year of there, there's this period of it's just you feel like you're being gaslit the entire time because you try to voice your concerns, complaints, and they basically just say, no, it's not that, it's this thing, but then you ask for more details and they can never give them to you. And it's just this in, infinite loop going on with it. So stuff like that, that you can't, one can't definitively say, like, because I'm trans, but if I were the same bearded lumberjack <laughs> that I was when I came here, would it have happened like that? It's hard to believe it would for me. So it's more things like that where have been the obstacles. Well, thank you so much for sharing those stories. And I know they've been valuable to all of us. Um, so my final question, and then I'm going to open up it to questions from the floor. Um, how can supporters of the LGBT community be better allies? How can we support? Dr. Grumman? So uh, in my personal experience, both with family, friends, and, and also in the, in the greater community, I think we have made tremendous strides and all of the uh, allies that already out there and are being very vocal initiatives such I'll go with you uh, for the, the transgender community that currently really need support and really need to be heard and need to be visible uh, are already making an impact. Uh, I think most important is to be vocal uh, to uh, others who are not as educated. So allies that uh, are standing up for their LGBTQ uh, friends um, and family members, um, educating others who might not be aware of uh, the inequalities that still exist. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, when it comes to health access, I think that's another topic um, that we can raise and should raise awareness of, and allies can do that. Um, for example, when it comes to healthcare at the moment and the discussion around healthcare for transgender uh, patients that are transitioning. And as uh, Emma said, most of her, her care was not covered. Um, I think that's an important issue uh, that needs to be addressed. So I think especially educating others and really standing up and being vocal about it is, an, is, is a tremendous help to, to all of us. And um, for us as LGBTQ community members, uh, really being appreciative of everybody who is already on board and is supportive of us, uh, I, I really appreciate everybody who, who, um, who, uh, who is supportive, uh, to be honest, because it shows the progress that we are making and that we are just as normal in quotation marks, whatever normal is. Uh, I don't think there is a normal actually. <laughs> so uh, as, as Carolyn pointed out, by us being able to be out and be ourselves and be just all over the spectrum uh, as everybody else is, uh, I think is, is a tremendous progress that we already make. I'm gonna reiterate that because I think we all know that if you're in a position of privilege, if you speak up for those who aren't in a position of privilege, you have a larger impact than the minority group speaking up for themselves. So the classic example, 
is with things that are much more visible like race. So if you're a white person in a position of power or a man in a position of power and you speak up for your African-American or female employees to make sure that they feel empowered, that has much more of an impact than the white or the African-American or female employee speaking up for herself. The same is true for LGBT relations. So as a heterosexual, cisgendered person, if you speak up for the LGBT community, you're gonna have a much larger impact than me speaking up for myself or Emma speaking up for herself and our community. So, and that includes not just in front of people who might be LGBT, right? So maybe you're with a group and you assume everybody there is straight, and somebody makes an off-color joke, and you go, well, no one here is going to be offended. But people can be in the closet. People can have family members who are LGBT and be offended. So if you, if, if you don't speak up, just like if somebody, if I heard somebody say in the N-word, I would speak up and say, dude, that is not the right word to say ever. The same thing should be true if somebody says, you know, faggot or dyke or one of those sorts of things in a joke, you as a straight person standing up and saying that's not okay is going to have a much larger impact than me doing it. And people might not say it in front of me because they know I'm gay, but they really think it. And so they say it elsewhere and where they think they are safe. And that's what we hope that you guys can do for the LGBT community every day. You know, it's basically just being kind of courageously loud and loudly courageous with your advocacy and standing up. As she said, when, especially when the people aren't around, that's really when it's needed the most. It's people always tend to filter themselves or try to filter themselves a little more when they're around the people, but. It's not always obvious, and even if it were obvious or everyone knows, it's still not okay if, a lot of times. And it's hard, but it's even harder for the people that are experiencing it, uh, especially just the, the energy required to stand up for yourself multiple times a day especially when it's kind of an authority figure is really exhausting. So. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your advice. Um, so now we're gonna open up the floor to questions. Does anyone have a question? Okay. Just a uh, quick comment, uh, really a question. I want to thank you all for, for uh, being here and for doing this. It's really... I think all this week we've been having crucial conversations. It's important to have all of these um, because sitting there, uh, I learned something new um, and I learned something important. Uh, and, I, and I think what um, we perhaps have hesitated to do in the past, which we're doing more and more, are talking about those things that are really impactful to you personally. And I think coming out and saying those things um, to us, to our community, and reminding us about the responsibilities we have and the things that we must know um, is critical. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for doing this um, and thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you, I think you'll see me from the cameras over there, uh, for, uh, for participating in, in, in this important conversation um, all week long. Uh, but this is, this is great, this is important, and thank you all for being here and being part of this conversation too. I'm also grateful to all of those involved in planning this session. I have a couple things I wanted to say. I wanted to underscore the comment that you all just made. Um, last week I attended a meeting where a student of color was being discussed. I found myself getting very upset and enough where I had to leave the room. And what was striking about that experience was that one of our administrators, Dr. Maureen Novak, was the one who spoke up and said, I think we might be um, experiencing possible implicit bias here. For a white administrator to say that so that I didn't have to was 
tremendously powerful. And so, I, I mean, she was concerned that I was going to be upset. I wanted to give her a hug. So I just wanted to underscore the importance of us backing each other up in those instances. I wanted to share one additional tip that I had to learn the hard way back in 1983. I was a first-year graduate student in Illinois in the counseling psychology program. I was meeting with an undergraduate student for a counseling session. During this intake, the entire time, the student was talking about the difficulty they were having with their partner. You see where I'm going with this. I assumed that we were talking about a heterosexual relationship. I made references about the boyfriend. And it wasn't until the very end where the student said to me, oh, and by the way, I don't have a boyfriend. And then it, I, I just through my mind kept hearing the word partner mentioned numerous times throughout the session. And I realized what I had done. And that was the biggest lesson that you could see after all these years I have not forgotten. And hopefully have never ever done that again because what I want to underscore here is the importance of not only asking questions, but also listening. Listening to what they are telling you. Listening to the words they choose and for you not to make assumptions on what that means like I, I did. And even then, I mean, here I am, daughter of Cuban immigrants, raised in Southern California. You would think that I would, quote unquote, know better. And um, that was a lesson that I learned that day and I don't mind repeating it so that it could be helpful to someone else. Thank you again. Thank you. Sorry, I was late. I had to hear from clinic, but <clears throat> I must say I had goosebumps when I walked in and saw the size of the audience that matched the other presentations we have had all this week. Thank you. Obviously, it is important to all of us, and clearly it's something we need to keep doing. Um, I would like to know from you, and we can follow up as well by email, what can we do as an institution in terms of visibility? What can we say out loud, whether on our website, or signs around the institution, whether it's in the medical space or the pharmacy space or the dental space, that can say all are welcome here. So you can think about it, send it later, but that's something we would like to make progress and move forward. Thank you, Dr. Perkins. I'm on the campus-wide LGBTQ plus presidential advisory committee. I think that's the name of it currently. And we work on that on a regular basis. Um, so I'll be happy to hook you up with the committee. Do we have any other questions? All right, I just wanna thank our panelists. Thank you so much for giving us your time and sharing with us your experiences. And I know that we've all learned a lot more I'm going to speak for myself, actually. I've learned a lot more from this panel, and I'm more educated now than I was before. So um, thank you all for coming, and have a beautiful afternoon. <laughs>